Hang on. All right, we got one more person jumping in here. So you should have the class materials um, in your inbox there for, for reference. Uh, let me go ahead. Let's get a PowerPoint going. Yeah, I thought it was a it was a it was a long day being there all morning, and it just he really brought the uh, enthusiasm for sure. So just to you know have that type of energy for an entire day, <laughs> so um, it was really good. But anyway, uh, okay, well let's jump in. So today we're going to talk about pricing. So pricing has always been important, and it's super important right now with the market having shifted. Um, you know, and I just saw something come across my email that said 50% of sellers are now willing to pay concessions as opposed to this time last year. And so uh, my how quickly things change uh, when the market changes. So um, and I noticed in my own neighborhood, there were four properties that went under contract yesterday um, in this neighborhood that I live in. So that was kind of kind of cool to see that and watch that progress. One of them was contingent, but the other the other three were all just um, going, you know, under pending sale pending. So that was exciting to see that movement. So a lot of good things happening out there in the market, I think. Um, just So we're going to talk about pricing today. So if you guys want to pull up your materials on page three is going to be the first spot we're going to start. And so I would like you just to kind of read through, um, take a minute and read through these paragraphs, and then we'll have a little discussion about it. All right. So a couple of you might still be reading, but I'm gonna go ahead and jump in on the first paragraph. So um, the first sentence, right? Your success all has to come back. It comes back to your value proposition. So what do we have to offer uh, that makes us stand out and unique? Um, Chris, you should have gotten it. I sent it to your your Remax account. You should have got that. Um, if you if you didn't, I'll. I'll do a stop share here in a minute and we'll get it over to you. So your I value don't have proposition. It either, Sarah, sorry. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, do you usually get stuff from me, Jan, and doesn't get stopped, caught in spam? Right. Hmm, okay. Anybody else missing the class materials? Jennifer has them. Okay. Let me re-forward these to. All right, try that now. Let's see if they went through that time. Okay. You are welcome. Okay, Chris got it. Okay. All right, sometimes email's slow. Um, okay, so, so that's really what this boils down to, right? Last two weeks, we've talked about allowing a seller to discover how you're different, right? And having a listing conversation versus a listing presentation. And so now we dig into what's your value proposition? You know, each of you bring something unique to the table, as I've said before, that, you know, people will gravitate towards, right? The way you do business. And so knowing what your value proposition is, if I met you in an elevator, would you be able to tell me in 30 seconds or less how you could sell my home? So, and, and how, what that, how that, how you stand out and be different. And so um, sellers want to work with people who, get the job done, right? And so then if you are able to do that, I love the last sentence is that, you know, you'd be in tremendous value, right? And in great demand. Um, in paragraph two, I always highlight this one that home sell for two reasons, price and exposure. So if we do a good job pricing it and we use the MLS and we have good photos and those things that we need to use in the MLS, we should expect that the home will sell. Now, are there other things we can do? Absolutely, right? A lot of other stuff we can do to expose that home and market it. Um, in paragraph four, or three, sorry, um, 
pricing. So the marketing is a part of the plan, right? But it shouldn't just necessarily be the folk, the total focus of your listing conversation. Um, yeah, the sellers want to know how you're going to market it, but we also have to think about, you know, what's the strategy? Um, every neighborhood, well, I shouldn't say every neighborhood, most neighborhoods, especially master plan communities have, you know, benchmarks that exist in the neighborhood, meaning that there's a, a top end for a 1500 square foot home and a low end for a 1500 square foot home. And these builders, when they built the master plan communities, they made our jobs easier, right? Because they built all the same product here, all the same product here. So it makes it easier. When you get into rural or other areas, like the neighborhood I'm in, there's no house that's the same. <laughs> so pricing and, you know, running comps gets more challenging because now you're, you're trying to find apples for apples. And so we talk about apples for apples. I don't want to try to I don't want to use a comp that's a two-story versus a single story, right? There's a different value in a single-story home versus a two-story. There's a different cost associated with building a two-story versus a single level. And so those are things we want to try to take into consideration. Sometimes you will have to deviate from that um, just because there's no data to use, but we really want to try to use apples for apples. So we'll get more into that. Um, <clears throat> and then in the last paragraph, so can I be the best marketer in the industry? That's really the question. Can I be the best marketer and can I can I be a pricing strategist? And so that's what this class, you guys, after you take this now, you can say, I'm, I'm going to use a seven-step proven strategy, TM, because that's trademarked with Remax. So you get to use that in your marketing. Uh, so, you know, Nate will tell you that he doesn't necessarily prospect every day, um, but he does market every day. So something's going out into the orbit that lets people know that he's in business. And so asking ourselves, are we doing that? You know, um, majority of us here, well, few of us spent, I guess, just me and just me and Scott, I guess, or Christian was there. Uh, you know, we've spent that whole day with Verl and, you know, he talked about action, right? A lot. Talked about taking action and that the difference between those that have success and those that don't is they focus on the right activities and they take massive actions to hoard those. And so um, same kind of thing here with, with listings is, is are we taking action to getting that property sold? All right, so a lot of this class is going to have scripts and dialogues that I'm not going to read to you guys today, just in lieu of time. Um, but we're going to get into the what are the actual seven steps. And so core values, we've seen these a lot, right? In momentum, almost every class has core values. And so we read through these. What are what are our beliefs? And so for me, I I, I would if I were you, I would print out all the core values that we talk about in momentum. And I would look at those before I start my prospecting. I would look at them before I go on a listing appointment, um, before I meet with someone, right? I want to have just those, fill, fill my bucket up with the right mindset, because that's also probably, I would say, three quarters of what we do in this industry, right, is mindset and whether or not we think we can have success or not. And so um, number two, we talked about this home, pricing homes is not an exact science. Uh, and then five, six, and seven. Um, these are, you know, the buyer determines the value, seller determines the price, the competition determines the entry. So what's available, what's active, okay? Buyer ultimately will determine what the value of the home is. Um, buyers these days, well, I shouldn't say that. Last three years, buyers have been willing to overpay for homes, <laughs> uh, but in a normal market, buyers are not typically willing to overpay for value of, of a property. And then the seller ultimately determines where they start the price, right? And that's where we want to help them take responsibility and accountability uh, for how they choose that entry point. OK, and, you know, based on timing, last week we talked about timing, that that's the two the two things that sellers have is price and time. And the third thing is usually something they expect of you. So if they need to be somewhere in 60 days, for example, but the data says it's going to take you 120 to sell that home, we need to be able to educate them of that fact. And then price now becomes more of a focus because if I have to price it more aggressively in order to get it sold quicker. Okay. Uh, so those are a couple of things on there that I have, like, I like to talk about. Uh, the seller's needs can never be justified, never used to justify the value. Um, I have a sweet client of mine. Um, she's in my very top, top 50. And uh, one year we were selling a property and she needed to get a hundred grand out of the property to pay her grandmother back. She'd borrowed money from her grandma and it just wasn't happening. The house had Satio tile everywhere. It needed work. The pool was just needed to be filled in. Like the house was just it had stuff, right? And finally, I had to say to her, like the market doesn't care about your grandma. Like I, I she's a sweet lady. I, I've met her, but the market doesn't doesn't care. And so we had to be a little bit, you know, price price the home differently. Um, and so that was a great it's a great example of a real seller using their needs to justify the price. Uh, and then. Uh, Number 19, so what's put in motion stays in motion. So sometimes the seller wants to start high um, and then they end up taking less than they would have than they would have if they just would have started out at the right price. 
right? Those of you who have been in the business long enough, Jennifer, you know that you've probably experienced that, right? With a seller who was, was difficult um, and then they ended up taking less than if they just would have priced it right. Um, <clears throat> so again, I would print these out and, and have them available so that you can read them often, especially if you have a difficult seller that you're working with, right? We talked about last week that don't be afraid to involve a third party um, to go out, have an appraisal done. If you guys like each other, but we just can't agree on price, you know, have, have a third party go out and then have them pay for it. And then you can reimburse them if you want at close of escrow. You don't want to pay for it up front because if it doesn't sell, now you're out that money, right? So, and again, that's a marketing tool that you can do. Now we can say the home is priced below appraisal. There's all kinds of fun things we can do with that. So becoming a strategist. Um, and I like that, right? Does that sound cool to put that on your resume, Kristen? I'm a pricing strategist. I'm a pricing badass, basically, is what that means, right? And so using that as you, you know, competition isn't doing it, right? Your competition isn't saying things like that. Um, I was, um, I, I'm getting ready to put my May piece in the mail. And uh, I decided to put a little buck slip in there that says, you know, it says basically want uh what's what did i say shoot now i'm drawing a blank something about i uh, wonder where your house is in today's values or something like today's market and then i'm using the qr code for my kv core landing page and instead of saying you know scan the qr code to find out what your home is worth i changed it to say scan the qr code to find out instantly what your home is worth so just a little thing, because that's it's instant, right? You, it pops right up. You guys played with that yet on your own house? It pops right up to let you know what what the value is, and it gives you it gives you different says what Zillow might say, a couple different options on there. Um, I would challenge you guys to do what Nate did. I didn't get as much response as Nate did. I did get some, and I have had some people not comment on my Facebook post, but I've seen them show up in my KV core that they went and asked. They went on the landing page and got um, got a uh, a report. So it's my plan to follow up with them and say, "Hey, you know, I saw you went to my page. Are you interested? You know, because basically the post said, "Do me a favor. I got this new tool. Will you go check it out and tell me if, if how accurate it is." So you guys can go copy mine if you want, copy Nate's, whatever. We don't care. Uh, <laughs> just use it and put it out on social media and see what kind of interaction you get from people, right? Um, so pricing strategies. So what do the sellers want? They want to sell their house, right? That's their goal. So um, why do home sell? Price and exposure. Uh, and then if they're in the MLS, if we are using the MLS the way that it needs, to, the way that it's intended to be used, um, then it's exposed, right? Uh, making sure that you have good directions, that your your write-up is good. Um, you know, don't use all caps in your write-up. <laughs> all caps is yelling, unless it's something worth yelling about. Uh, and that's all searchable content, you guys. So, you know, making sure, like I like to put bedroom, square footage, school district. I know all that's already in the MLS, but that's cert that, that those um, write-ups are searchable content. And so if I put that in there now, it's, you know, and the MLS sheets are hard to read, right? So if I put that in the verbiage and I'm selling what my life might be like in this area, as long as you're following fair housing stuff, um, you got to stay away from, stay away from words like friendly neighborhood. That's subjective. Um, walking distance from something because what if I can't walk? Uh, so we want to be be aware of some of those fair housing things. But that the MLS write up is searchable content. Uh, professional photography. It's a no brainer these days, you guys. It's so cheap, um, and there's so much value to that. Now that being said, you don't need 25 pictures of the outside of the house, right? We want to have 25 really nice shots of the home that capture everything about the property. Uh, we went from doing little photos to 70 photos and the consumer's feedback because they don't want to see that many photos. They want to see the right photos, okay? 40% uh, of the homes in the list, that's not accurate for our market. It's about 25% of homes that fail to sell each year. And it's mostly because they're not priced right. We can overcome condition and location all day long with price. Um, and then again, who determines the price? The seller does. Uh, but does the seller have direct access to the MLS? No, they don't. You know, they, that they has to come to us. Uh, and then, so why are the homes priced incorrectly? Because the agent has been ineffective at advising the seller what the appropriate price entry point is. Um, and some of this is like, we just don't, we don't want to hear the no. All right, we're, we're desperate to get the listing. We don't want to hear the no. So we're willing to let that seller drive the conversation. And in reality, that it doesn't do you any good to get a bunch of listings that never sell, right? There's cost associated with that. And it just, it sucks this life out of you. So um, so being, being able to have hard conversations with someone and being honest with them. Um, I always like to say like, I, you know, Scott, I don't want to set you up for failure. And if I don't, if I don't 
tell you right now the, the truth about how to price your home, then in a couple of months, I'm going to have to beat you up for a price reduction. I don't like doing that and you don't like doing it. So it's a much better route if we just agree today to price the home where, where it's going to sell. Um, because that we've all had that. I mean, and it's no fun. It's no fun to have to beat somebody up for a price reduction. Uh, so we want to be strong on being able to be honest with people and advise them. Uh, the note at the bottom of page five is your ability to price a home is not the question. What the question is, is your ability and your willingness to lead the seller down a path of self-discovery that ends with them taking ownership of the correct price entry point. All right. So can I ask absolutely. a quick question? Sure, absolutely. I obviously haven't listed a house, but on the other side, I've had some success with homes that have been up for sale for a while and getting them down to a reasonable price. But um, I, I've noticed that some people, and the market's changing right now, but some agents will go with the higher price. And, and you know, when you look at it, that it's way out of line with the market. Mm -hmm. um, are they just kind of trying to buy the business and get the people on board with them? Or is it just that they don't know how to price something? It could be both, to be okay. honest. I mean, it could be both. They, I, I would say they lack confidence um, and they lack they lack knowledge. Um, okay. So I think it's both. And so sometimes, you know, I've taken over price listings. I've had it happen. Um, but, you know, I try not to. But sometimes, you know, you, the seller has some need or some, you know, some logic. And so you do it so you don't lose the listing. But, you know, you can... The challenge with that is that they're going to have amnesia and, you know, you have the conversation with them, they get amnesia three months into it and they forget what you told them. And so what you could do is if you like each other and the, the appraisals off the table, build price reductions into the listing agreement. Scott, we're going to try it your way for 30 days. And after 30 days, we're dropping the price and you put it in the listing agreement. Now, no one gets amnesia. Okay. Right. But, but I think, yeah, the seller, those, those agents, they probably lack confidence. And I would definitely say they lack uh, skill and expertise. So, because if you don't, if you have skill and expertise, that builds your confidence, right? right. And right. if you know the market and you know the data, you're, you feel comfortable being able to convey that to the seller. And then you have facts and, and, and information that trumps their, you know, their needs or their logic, right? And so mm -hmm. I think it's a combination of both. Okay. So, um, and there's a whole lot of agents running around out there, so... <laughs> um, okay, so facilitating intelligent decisions. So this is the perfect slide for you, which you just asked. And then page six is agents fail to effectively lead the seller to appropriate price entry point because they lack knowledge, confidence, judgment, or they just don't care. Um, there was a guy years ago that had um he had his own house up for sale in Arrowhead Ranch for years. Just had the sign up way out of price, but he was doing it to get leads, right? Now, Shannon would probably not approve of that. Uh, <laughs> he was not one of our agents, but we all laughed because like this house is totally overpriced. And of course he did that on purpose, right? Didn't really sure. want to sell his house. He was just doing it to get leads. Um, so and some agents just don't care, right? They just take the listing because they're going to take the listing um, and they think they're going to leverage it for other, for, for leads, right? Um, yeah. So lack of knowledge. So we, we don't have all the information. Lack of confidence is that we submit to the seller's demands um, and the agent is scared of the hard conversation and perceives conflict as a disagreement. Fear, fearing uncertainty or not wanting to disappoint or be disliked, okay? So how many of us really like conflict? Like, me. put me in uh, yeah, but, me. but here's the thing you guys think about conflict as friction so when we have friction if we didn't have friction we wouldn't have fire All right so whoever discovered if they rub two rocks together would create fire and so we had to think about friction or conflict in a different way when conflict happens it's an opportunity for us to resolve it right? And, and have a positive outcome. But so many of us run from it because it's uncomfortable, right? We don't want, we don't want somebody to dislike me or be upset with me. Okay. So conflict is not a bad thing. Lack of judgment. The agent thinks that it's only about taking the listing. Um, and then lack of, or lack of care is that they only want to leverage the listing. And, you know, it, there is a statistic that says that for every listing, one and a half buy side should happen. Uh, six to eight leads should be generated for that, from that listing. And that, um, you know, one to three more homes on that same street in that same area could be listed over the next 90 days. And so, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity to leverage, but again, it doesn't do you any good 
to take a bunch of listings that never sell, okay? Uh, so what's the role of the advisor to determine and justify value and, and, and also determine where, what's the entry point, right? If, you, if you've got a, a neighborhood that has a benchmark of 350, 325 to 350, and that you want them to price it at 335, you've got to be able to demonstrate that, right? And get them to agree to that. Um, what I will do, which is a great technique, is, is I'll run um, cost sheets at all three ranges. And I'm building in closing costs. I'm building in a home warranty uh, because why? I'm going to have a seller say, well, Scott, I'm not paying closing costs. If a buyer wants to buy my house, they need to have their own money. Okay, well, I can appreciate that, but let's just go ahead and put it in here because the, the likelihood that you're going to get, you don't have to accept it, but the likelihood that you may get an offer with concessions is very high in this market. And then if we get an offer that doesn't have concessions, first of all, if I do, then it's not a surprise to the seller, right? Because we've already talked about it. Secondly, if I get an offer that doesn't have concessions, I get to put that money back in their pocket, which makes them very happy. Right. And but but we address the issue up front. Now it's not a hard conversation once we get the offer. And then I'll price it 325, 335, 350 on my cost sheets. Right. And then it's a beautiful thing when they say, well, gee, Sarah, we should price it at 335. Exactly. That's exactly what I wanted. Right. And so we want to walk them through that path. And, the, and then the pricing or the um, closing cost is one way to do that. OK. And I always have them initial the payoff. Because if it's wrong or inaccurate, they're not going to initial it. And I, nine times out of 10, when my cost sheet is off, it's because we had the payoff wrong. Or in some cases, there was a second loan that they forgot to tell me. Okay. So just, I always have them initial that. Um, so what determines the value? The features, amenities, and condition of the subject home. And we're going to dig into that a little bit more. Uh, and then what justifies that value? So the features, conditions, and amenities of sold or expired properties. Um, we, I think we need to be checking expireds. Um, we got out of the habit of doing that. So we don't really have to, right? Because the market was so robust. But expireds tell us what people have done before us. They've tried and failed. All right. And so we need to be able to put that information in front of the seller, especially if they're wanting to go that route. You could say we could try that. But here's a list of people who did and they failed to sell. So which which group of people do you want to be in? The ones that succeeded or the ones that failed? All right. Uh, and then what the current market determines the entry point. How, what's your competition? What are the trends existing? Um, there was a condo complex that I sold a, a unit in a few years ago. All of the condos needed new roofs. And so they were assessing each unit five grand. Well, that's a at the time that was a lot of money, right? And so those are things that are that are, that are uh, specific to that neighborhood that are that are, that are trends, right? That we need to pay attention to that affect the value of the home, um, and then what justifies the entry point, the active properties, okay? Um, so it's kind of gross, but up here with all the rain and and how many houses that have septic tanks, a lot of the leach beds of overflowed and so they're like telling you not to do anything with the, the natural creek beds and even like don't go kayaking because <laughs> everything's nasty right so but you wouldn't know that unless you lived up here and you knew that a, a lot of the houses had septic tanks and this was something that could happen right and so that's also a thing that could affect value right um, mother nature sometimes she's a, a mad <laughs> um, uh, she gets mad at us so and she does things like that um Okay, so is it so we're looking at page seven here. Uh, sellers will trust. Wait, hold on. Am I on the right page? Yes, I am. So sellers will trust and follow what you can logically and tangibly ex explain, right? So is it better to tell them or have them discover? Discover. Absolutely, right? Because we don't want to come in and, and assume we know what's best for them. Um, and make that decision for them. Okay, that's in, and I think a lot of agents put that pressure on themselves that they have to assume what's best in the seller's interest. And, you know, I took a, a, a class on overcoming biases and one of the examples was exactly that. Oh, hold on a second. I got somebody in the waiting room. Sorry, Chris. Okay, um, I didn't see that pop up. So they we're talking about biases and the example was two buyers, one, you know, she, the example was, the, the realtor said, you don't want to buy a home in the city because when you have children, you're going to want to be in a better school district. So that's making an assumption, right? That's making an assumption that a young couple, I have a bias that I think that a young couple is going to, I'm going to assume that they're going to want to have children. And so the same thing with the seller, right? We can't assume that we know what's in their best interest, right? Um, so that's why we've got to ask a lot of questions. And I, I shared with you guys on the last call is that, you know, one of the most beautiful presentations I saw Nate ever do or conversations was literally, what's your goal and how can we help you get there? 
Never talked pricing, never talked commission, never talked marketing. It was simply a beautiful question. And this lady was at a, a stage in her life that she needed to, you know, close this chapter and move on to the next chapter. And so, um, so you guys, I think we put, a, like I said, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to know what's going to be in the best interest of the seller. And that simply isn't, we, we don't have all those answers. And so we just have to ask the questions. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so I am going to move forward. Sorry, Chris, I, I didn't see you pop in. So thanks for sending me that text. Um, all right. So here's our features amenities. So, so we talk about, oh, do I have it on here? Hold on. I think we okay it's coming up in a couple of slides so the the features amenities and condition so subject home sold home expired what's the seller's financial needs um i want to ask how much they owe and if they have more than one mortgage right there are still some sellers out there that do uh and then what are the trends and conditions for the area and then what are the active homes and then what's the seller's timing um there's a pocket in avondale um jennifer you probably know this neighborhood that for whatever reason they're they're lovely homes but they take much longer to sell than all the other homes. And it's, it's a, maybe it's a zip code, I can't remember, but anyway. Um, and it's very curious to me because I'm like, well, why? Well, why does this happen? And it's just that particular pocket of Avondale that homes take longer to sell. And so we would need to know that and understand why, like, why is that? And now we have to price appropriately because it just takes longer to sell, right? Um, and a lot of agents are freaking out because, you know, <laughs> we've been so used to things going on the on the market and selling so quickly that I'm like, oh my God, it didn't sell. What do I do, right? It's okay, take a beat. <laughs> it's gonna be all right. Uh, the arts and price, science of pricing. So leading the seller to the most appropriate price point. Um, and so then helping them assemble and interpret the facts, right? Our job when we price a home is to, is to investigate. Why did a home sell? What caused it to sell? Um, why did it not sell? Right. And so we, that's our job is to dig into that. And we, it, you know, it's not a one and done. I want to run a map search. I want to run a, a tax search. I want to look at, I want to spend a lot of time in getting in there. If I need to go preview, I'm going to do that. Like really spending the time. I think it, it should take you at least two hours to really do an effective uh, market analysis. Okay. And really spending the time and understanding what's going on in there. I mean, you could even go as deep as like, you know, what is a school district, you know, um, because that that's a benefit in some neighborhoods, right? Arizona ranks among the, the worst schools in the nation. And so if you've got a school district that is tops, that's going to be a selling value, right? Um, I'm not going to go down the weeds too much with this, but what if the seller has a VA or an FHA that's assumable? That now becomes a little hidden gem, right? And understanding that that becomes something that would put that house in a different uh, category of value there, okay? Um, all right, so I want to jump forward to this. Okay, so seven steps. So this is the what you guys came here to get, right? The, the seven-step pricing strategy, TM. This supports a relationship-based approach, okay? And again, I'm not coming in to be the dictator and tell you what to do. I'm coming in to present the facts, help you self-discover and help you take accountability in how we price the home, right? And then it's up to me to do the marketing, expose it and bring the buyers in, okay? Uh, so step one is identifying a gain and an understanding of the value ranges that exist in the neighborhood, okay? Um, and another thing I'm gonna do when I run comps is I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a full, I wanna look at everything and I'm probably gonna print that out as a one-liner I'm not necessarily going to use that to comp, but here's what I don't want to have happen is I don't want to go in that appointment and the seller knows something about a house that I don't know, even if it wouldn't be a comp, right? If it's a two story or it's bigger, smaller, whatever, um, I don't want to be caught off guard because then that make, it takes me out of my game and then it makes, it gives the sellers, I feel like it gives the sellers an advantage over me that they know something I don't. So I want to look at everything and have a one-liner and that way if they say Jim and Sally's house, oh, which, what was the address? Oh, you see, I wouldn't use that as a comp because dot, 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 but I have the information. It doesn't throw me off my game. Does that make sense? So I want to take a look at that whole thing that exists there. Number two is I want to test the logic by using expireds. Okay, so go back again. These are the people who have failed. I think expireds and canceled because even a canceled usually means that the seller had a change in plans, but it's still data that could possibly be used. Okay, step three is to determine the value range most suited for the subject home. So you got to know, did your seller, you know, if you're looking at comps and all of the comps have been updated, that's something to take into consideration. 
if the comps are mixed, right? Some homes have been updated, some haven't, um, or no updates, right? Those are things we have to take into consideration. And then we have to know what's the condition of your subject property and how does it stack up against those other homes. If it's been highly upgraded, well, now that puts us at the top of the food chain, right? In that neighborhood. And so you have to look And some nice way I said last week is that sometimes it's, it makes sense to go see the house first and then come back and do your comps, okay? Especially if it's been highly upgraded or it's something unique or rural or whatever luxury. Uh, so we wanna test the logic. Um, number three, again, the value range most suited for that subject home. And then step four is strategically position the subject home within the value range. So again, let's say that they updated the kitchen but the baths haven't been updated. Well, that's gonna put me at the higher end of the range, but not at the top of the range. Does that make sense? And, and really getting in there and looking at that. Kitchens and baths, you guys, are the top two things that home buyers want to see updated um, and, and being relevant, okay? Uh, and there's sometimes homes that become what we call functionally obsolescent. Um, so like I looked at a house over here in my neighborhood that <laughs> had an elevator, which was kind of cool, kind of scary, but cool at the same time, but it only had two and a half baths and it was like a, 3,000 square foot house. And so that is a, a functionally obsolescent home in the, in today's world, right? It should have three or four bathrooms. And so those are things you have to overcome as well um, as far as what's, what's, what's happening in that neighborhood, okay? And it also affects price, right? Someone who wants to buy a home that, you know, let's say they have four children and having a fourth bathroom or third bathroom is important to them. It's going to affect the value that someone's willing to pay for that home. Right. Same thing with garages. Garages can make homes um, functionally obsolescent as well. You can have, like I sold that house last year in surprise, 2,800 square feet, five bedrooms. Um, so great home for somebody with needing a lot of rooms, but only had two car garage. And all the new construction was out there in, in Asante, all the new construction happening all has three car garages. And so I had to tell my sellers, like, this is an issue that you're going to have to overcome because why would I pay this price for your house and I can go to the builder, get a brand new house um, with a three car garage for a similar price. All right. So we got that's another thing, too. You've got to know about new construction happening in the area because uh, that definitely is a competitor. And even though the resale might be a better price, because people don't think about landscaping, window coverings, you know, all those things that go into a new home. Right. They just think no one's used that toilet. I want a new home. Right. And so there is there is a difference there between the values of reselling and, and, and new construction. Uh, number five. Verify the pricing position chosen that sell, um, satisfy, satisfies the seller's financial needs. So again, got to know what they owe on the property. Um, do they have, you know, again, do they do they need to make a certain amount of money? Not necessarily using that to justify pricing, but you know, we need to know what what that is. Uh, step six is analyze all homes that are directly competing with the subject home. So what's the competition? Are there for sale by owners? Are there new construction? You know what's going on that 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 that, if, that competes with your property? Okay. And then step seven is determine the most appropriate price entry point based on the seller's timing. So if, if we know that the average time is 45 days or 60 days in that neighborhood, then they need to be gone sooner. We've got to price it more aggressively to move it quicker. I hope that makes sense because um, it's got to be perceived to the consumer as a really good value um, in order for it to move faster. OK, uh, so this is on page 10. So the seven step pricing strategy will not reveal a difference. Um, Sorry, um, it, it will not reveal a difference in a in price from a typical CMA. It will, however, allow a seller to better have a better opportunity to self discover the most appropriate price um, in end price, which then helps us to have less objections, right, and creates a win win uh, relationship. Okay. Um, yeah, let me jump to the next page because this is the page that talks about our features and amenities. Um, okay have it on here I don't okay hold on so just <laughs> page 11 I don't know why I don't have it on my slides but uh the procedure so create a custom CMA report that includes the following neighborhood data okay the features that are really important to take into consideration number of bedrooms if it's two-story or single uh, two-story single story maybe a basement not very many of those in Phoenix uh the square footage the year built does it have a pool or not and the lot description so those are the six things that consumers find to be the most important and those are the things you want to stack your data against okay um number of bedrooms the bathrooms the two-story versus single story and on the lot so what I like to do on lot is I'll go 10 percent and I'll do this on square footage too 10 percent below and 10 percent above 
So if it's a 1500 square foot house, I might go 1300 to 1600, depending on how much data is available. If I got a lot of data, I might winnow that down and go 1400 to 1600. So it's all going to depend when I plug in my stuff, how much, how, how much comes back at me. And then I might look at, you know, if I, I'm going to look at subdivision first. Um, and then if I, if I don't have anything in my subdivision, I might go by zip code. I might go by school district. All right. So appraisers are going to go one mile radius out. OK, and so I want to try to stay as close and as, as, as much as I can to apples to apples. But sometimes, especially in older neighborhoods, you're going to have to go outside that range. OK. Um, in Avondale, one thing I will say about Avondale is there is a distinct difference in values if you're south of the 10 versus being north of the 10. And so that's an important question to ask. And Jennifer, you're kind of shaking your head. <laughs> so there's a difference. Right. Uh, and there's a difference. You know, there's an area of, of, of Phoenix, um, Cave Creek to it was about so about 16th Street to Hare Cave Creek. There's a whole little pocket in there that that there's some really nice stuff, and then there's some not so nice stuff, right? So we want to look at look window down into those zip codes, right, and then figure out are there pockets in there, okay? Uh, lot description. So same thing. I might go plus or minus 10% here, um, especially if it's on acreage. If it's in a master plan community, and I but it's in a cul-de-sac or it backs to a green belt. Those are things I'm going to take into consideration. Most of the time, those properties are just on little postage stamp lots and it's not as big of a deal. But if I'm getting into acreage or somebody who's got, you know, quarter acre, something special, golf course, I need to take that into consideration when I'm running my comps, okay? Because again, apples to apples. And those things sometimes have value. Now with a golf course, um, depending on where it is in the golf course, it may not have value. It might be a negative. Um, there are what we call the slice side of golf courses. <laughs> and so those houses right, get so. pummeled uh, with, with golf balls. And so um, that's the worst when you're showing a house that's on a golf course and they're asking how safe it is. And all of a sudden a golf ball lands <laughs> at your feet. And so That's a fun one to have happen. Uh, so yeah, so there's, there's some things that are not positive. Same thing with pools. Um, a house with a diving pool actually it doesn't have a lot of value because it's a lot of maintenance um, and people just don't want diving pools these days. And so um, that isn't always a positive. Up here, having a pool really doesn't have any value because even in the summertime, when the sun goes down, you're not getting in your pool. It's too cold, right? Kristen, you, you, and you know, you grew up here. Now, if you have a spa, that's totally different. So, and there are areas too, in certain areas of, of Phoenix, like the pools just don't have the same value. And so, and pools too, can be one of those things that is, um, preference, right? Lifestyle choice. Same thing with solar. Um, solar kind of, solar was weird in the beginning. I think now it's gotten a little bit different reputation. Um, and I know when I, during the COVID market, the homes with solar seemed to sell a little bit slower than the ones without, right? And I don't want to go down a rabbit hole with solar, but definitely want to do your due diligence there. Um, Tara, I forget her last name, just she does a class on solar that's really good. So if you get get it, if you see that come across your, <clears throat> your uh, agenda, you should probably tune in. It's a CE class and she does a great job explaining the difference between leased and owned solar and how that affects property values. Um, and she does, um, maybe I'll get her in for another class, but she does a really great job with that. Uh, so those are the six things that we want to focus in on. Okay. When you guys are looking at comps and really painting, you know, digging in and investigating. Um, let's see. So step two. So again, test the logic against the expired step four or three, um, determine the value of the, the range that exists. Uh, I'm going to get down into some, some, um, scripts. Okay, let me see. Okay, that's all duplicates. A couple of, some of these pages are just repetitive, so I want to get down to page 16. Oh, come on, let's go. Okay. So again, I'm not going to read all these to you, but starting on page 16, you've got a dialogue, a, a script for um transitioning into talking about the comps right and and using the, the price and exposure so if you told me you need to be out of your home in 60 days let me assure you that's my goal uh but we need to that, that goal revolves around two basic components price and exposure okay and then you've got some examples of some transitional questions in there uh let me ask you do you think that a pricing strategy is important if you could share with me why um and then if you disagree with them may i consult you a little on pricing okay so again we don't want to assume that we're we have all the answers may i consult you on the pricing sounds a lot better than you're wrong mr seller you're an idiot um so i gotta tell you what to do right uh so um 
And I think it's important if you ask the question, let me ask you, do you think a pricing strategy is important? Be quiet, right? That's uncomfortable for us to have that weird silence, but he who speaks first loses. And so let them have time to process the question. And this is then allowing them to take responsibility if we be quiet and let them answer the question. Because if they're serious about selling their home, they're going to say yes right? They're, they're, they're going to say yes. Now, and I'm not saying you're not going to run into some difficult sellers out there that would that, that are going to push you. Yeah, it's going to happen, right? It's going to happen if you go on enough listing appointments. Uh, so then here's a script for the justification on how to, the pricing game is all about justification. And I love the end. Leaving your money on the table is simply unacceptable. Wouldn't you agree? And we can say things like that. That makes them feel like you're not just in it for a quick buck, right? That you are there to represent them and to get them the best price, okay? Um, all right, so page 17, um, this is a script on identifying and gaining an understanding of the value ranges, okay, uh, and just going through what, what have I done? I, I've analyzed the sold and expireds um, of, of these areas, and, and here also this class teaches uh, to not necessarily overwhelm them with a huge giant, pre, uh, you know, listing or um, comps. Now, I know some of you are probably going to be using the KV Core thing, which I haven't played around with that yet to see how that looks for uh, listing appointments and running comps for people. Has anybody messed with that at all? No? Everybody's saying no? Jen, is Jennifer on here still or did she drop off? Or she just went in off video. Um, so that I've heard good things about. Nate has been saying it look, really looks good. Uh, you also have... Um, toolkit cma and then there's there's rpr that you can do as well they're all tools that you can use for cmas um you still have to plug in all the data what i like about i think it's toolkit is it is branded to remax um but here's the thing appraisers look at three three solds three pendings and three uh, not even really pendings but in three actives that's what they look at and that's really all you need you don't have to come in with a bunch of data if there's more data fine but really try to focus in on the three best sold properties that have sold in the last mo no more than six months right i'd say 90 days and how fast things are moving okay so and if you don't have 90 days then go back six months right um, but you want to find the three best properties that that are suited to them that are as close to apples and apples if you can get a model match that's even better um and then you know again if you have more data that's fine but really it comes down to just having that solid what's the three competitors what's three pendings and I'll, i will call the listing agent on those pendings and say hey go on an appointment would you mind telling me what you sold that property for what is under contract some agents are going to tell you no but some will give you a range right and did you get multiple offers what was the scoop you know so I, i'm gonna i'm gonna ask they don't have to tell me but i'm gonna ask right because again my job is to investigate why did those homes sell and then if i can give that information sometimes the sellers know it <laughs> so because they have the nosy neighbor thing going on so um but i want to ask right i want to know on those pending properties okay um, and then so the next script here on page uh, 18 is testing the logic using the expireds. Um, so and the question here is, as you can see, the homes like yours have failed in this range. Why do you think that is? So all these scripts have questions at the end, and that is designed to um, it's a closing technique, right? And it's a way to help them take responsibility. So when you ask a question, now they have to answer it, right? I'm taking responsibility. Um, on that. Uh, the next script on page 19 is for step three. So um, after previewing, or I'm sorry, after reviewing the buyers in your neighborhood who have said yes and no over the past three, four, six months, um, given the features of your home, which range do you think your home best identifies with? And then um, again, be quiet and let them answer. Okay. Uh, page 20, let me take this off because we're not, don't need to have that on there. So page 20, now, this is our, our, our script on how to strategically position the home. Um, so we want to verify that the seller's financial needs are being met. Uh, and then if while you tour the home, it's important to point out those amenities, okay, that you think add value to the home. Pay attention to things that they're pointing out to, because if they geek out about something specifically, then you want to make sure that um, you, you're talking about that and whether it has value or not, okay? Um, solar, go, again, going back to the example of solar, solar is a lifestyle, lifestyle choice, right? Not everybody wants solar and not, not everybody has value of solar, okay? Um, and it and does definitely have a difference whether it's owned or leased, okay? Um, Jen put in here, she likes RPR, okay? Nice, okay. Another thing too um, is I would check Zillow and Redfin. Um, we're not going to use those to price the property, but that seller has been on those sites, 
And the last thing I want is for them to have something that I don't know, right? And so that they they own a home, they've been on those sites. They know they know what those those places are telling them what their home is worth. Okay. Um, the rest of the pages in here are just scripts to support each of the steps. So read through them, um, master them, right? And then on page 23, uh, announce the prevention. How will you feel if your home sells tomorrow? Well, I would feel like we priced it too low. Well, can I ask, can I ask why you would feel that way? Is your goal to meet your needs within the designated time frame? Would you agree that if we price the home at the appropriate price entry point, it would increase our odds of getting one or more offers within your designated time frame? Or would you feel your needs were any less satisfied that if the offer came in on the first day or the 60th day. Um, and so we got to address that up front with people. Um, you know, and I like to ask the question too, tell me about the last time you sold a home. If they've never sold a home, they still have a story, right, of someone that they know that sold their home. Um, and that helps me to understand where my bar is at. <laughs> Did they have a short sale or foreclosure, right? My bar is way down here. Did it sell in four hours with 50 offers? Now my bar is up here. So I want to ask that question. Tell me about the last time. And if they say, well, I feel like I underpriced it, then now I'm really going to make sure I talk about pricing and that I talk about they're eliminating that remorse for them. Uh, one of my favorite scripts that is not anywhere, it's my own script, is that the National Association of Realtors says that for every 10 showings, we should get an offer. If we don't have an offer, then you know we're getting the showings, but we're not getting the offers. We're off on price. If we're getting no showings. We're definitely off on price. Um, and I love it when they get to the eleventh showing, and they haven't had an offer, and they call me and say, "Sarah, we need to reduce the price." Right? That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> so it makes my life easier, right? And so that's a script that that is not anywhere, but it's a true script. And so that's something to share with people that for every ten showings, we should get an offer. Okay. Um, all right, and then the last page here on page 24 is just the summary. So why do I why would I list my home with you? Because I get results, right? What do sellers want? They want to sell their house. And if you have the if you have the MLS, which you all do, you can and you can price something correctly. Uh, and by the way, I would I would just play with it. You know, pick a house in your neighborhood, especially for my newer people, run comps on it and then watch it and see what happens, how close you are, right? Uh, and, you know, pay attention to that. And you're, I would set yourselves up on a search in your own neighborhood, period, just to see what's going on, you know, see what's coming on the market and what sells. Um, it's just kind of fun to do that. So, uh, and then if you're using the MLS, the homes are exposed and they get syndicated out to tons and tons of different places. Um, I'm pretty excited with the KV Core stuff that we have coming up. I got a text on Sunday. Um, it, it sent out a text message to somebody in my database and said, happy birthday. That was pretty cool. And it, she messaged me back. I was like, wow, I didn't even know <laughs> that this thing was going to do that. So I, there's a lot of really cool stuff that, that, that we have with KV Core. Um, so last page again, just like I said, is, is a recap of everything. Um, speaking of KV Core uh, tomorrow, Alex is doing three different sessions for us. So AM, nine o'clock is uh, beginners. 10 a.m. is intermediate, and then uh, 11 is advanced. So, so depending on how you feel your competency level is with KV Core, um, you know, tune into those. Or if you want to go to all three, you're certainly welcome to. Um, and those are going to be at Arrowhead North with with Alex. So um, I think I think he's diving in and like actually doing like hands-on type training with you guys. So. I definitely encourage you to check that out. And then Thursday, we have the uh, lunch and learn on um, investment properties with Tina Powers and Richard Cook. So that'll be a good one to attend as well. So any questions, comments, thoughts? No, everybody's quiet today. All right, Jennifer, you got some thoughts. You're, you're seasoned here amongst everyone. Anything you do specific when you price houses that is we didn't talk about? Mm, I I don't know if it's just sometimes that I don't oh I always look at comps before I go on a, an appointment to see a seller always so I already have a good feeling for what I think the house is worth but again you always have to see the house in person because you can't smell things in certain <laughs> homes. Um, <laughs> You don't know what they've done to the house. Maybe you sold it to them. You don't know what they, how they live like. You know, there's so many different things. So you have to go see it. Um, but I don't ever do any type of formal listing presentation on paper. Nothing like that. It's all, I don't even take my computer with me. I just have a conversation with them knowing what the approximate value of their home is. And then when I get there, I can say, well, this is what I, this is what I think, or I ask them, what do you think your house is worth before I even bring up my price? Mm -hmm. So uh, normally we're always pretty close in range. So Jeez. I've been lucky, I guess. Oh, I 
like <laughs> and mute him. Um, yeah, and you know, you make a good point. So a lot of these these you know companies out there, you can't sell a house on an algorithm. That's why you know so many mm-hmm. of them have just lost their butts, millions and millions of dollars, um, and so. And so you know, if, if it backs to a high school, if it's got, you know, just something, you know, there's all kinds of things that you just can't, you don't know unless you go look at the house. And so I agree. And again, you know, don't be afraid to do a two-stepper if you need to. Um, and that's not, that's not, uh, it's not a bad thing if you need to do that. So, um, all right, I'm gonna let you guys go. So if you need anything, reach out. Uh, we got some good stuff coming. And then I think I already told you, we do have that deeds class, the deed fraud class, May 18th. That's a free CE class. I think it's re- uh, legal issues. It's going to be on Zoom. It's going to be, I think it's going to be a really, really good class uh, to take. Um, Who knew that uh, deed fraud was such an issue, but something we definitely need to to be aware of. So um, that's coming up May 18th, so a month from now. So plenty of notice for you guys to get that on your calendar. So nine to noon. So um, if you need anything, reach out. Otherwise, have a fantastic day. And hopefully uh, we'll see you in some classes later this week. All right. Thanks, Sarah. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye.